Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, this is part of the empowerment series. We just had a staff meeting, like we normally do, but I want you guys to listen to the conversation because it was done with you all in mind, mainly our clients, which many of you are, but it was also done to educate everyone. Now I'm going to let it play and remember this is what we would normally talk about okay but I made it to where it was directed mainly at each of you and then I'm gonna probably share a little bit at the end so give me one second without any further ado who should be here because I spoke with her earlier today all right there is Miss Sandy we're gonna go ahead and get started uh, ladies and gentlemen, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the 1099-Cs. Each one of the individuals who did a 1099-C I'm going to need you to understand there are two things that are going on here. The contract I apologize for that. Don't know what happened to my signal, uh, but we will go ahead and go from there. The contract involves the Eon Foundation, the sole proprietorship of the Eon Foundation. The address is the same for all three Eon Foundations. Well, actually, no. The corporation is out of Florida. The contact address is still Vegas. But there are three Eon Foundations. One's a corporation. And one's a nonprofit, and the other is a sole proprietorship. This was done under the sole proprietorship. So you'll be doing it for the Eon Foundation, and I'll have to get the EIN number for you all for that. So for right now, you'll just be doing it and putting it in there, and for the Eon Foundation, and then you'll be doing one for each of the clients. We are the creditors. The um, foundation had a partnership with each one of the clients, which allowed him to speak on behalf of the clients to these creditors. And so we are the creditors. Sandy has given you guys the award amounts. You're going to indicate everything that she told you literally. You're not going to add any more sentences or any lines or any care of. There have been at least two people who have in the address line for the creditor putting care of the name of the CEO. Nobody asked you guys to do that. Nowhere in any instructions were you ever told to do that on a 1099-C. You were only told that to put that on the mailing address, which means somebody just copied the address from the mailing address. And the problem is the amount. because you guys are going to know our need to know this. So give me a second. Let's see. We're going to open up. Yeah, we're going to open up this one. This one is giving me a problem because I saw about 20 YouTube windows open up. Not going to do too much worry about them because I haven't been looking at 20 so-called YouTube uh, warnings. Give it a second for that to pull up. Uh, the fact is, this past weekend, there was a strange creature that came near my property and he set the alarm off. I don't know the person, so I didn't answer. He was outside waving his hands or anything. I don't care. If it was an emergency, I'm not the place to go for an emergency. So I know he wasn't coming here because of an emergency as he was walking. However, this person is looking at my solar panels. And my cameras, I just had to upgrade it to pay for a the putting it up in the cloud. Because he was looking at the solar panels, and quite a few people drive by my place looking at my solar panels. I figured he was just coming to ask how my system was set up because people with solar panels have that situation. 
he turns around, adjusts his backpack. He has one of those backpacks with the strings on it, not with the straps, but with literal, the thin little shoelace string type backpack, that elastic. And he proceeds to walk down a street where nobody lives. There is nothing in that direction that he walked down. It leads to another road about a mile and a half to two miles from my place. So I knew he didn't live around here, so I told everybody on the call, he's probably homeless, and homeless people come out here to encamp all the time. But it's winter time, so no homeless person comes out this way during the winter. Even though we're at 84 degrees today, it's not normally 84 degrees. January into February, we are our highest, probably 40 to 45 degrees, and we are as low as 14 degrees this time of year. But something is definitely off this year so 40 minutes later i see in the cameras a police car uh suv the normal police suv that pulls by he drives by three times a week at first it used to be once a week but because the neighbors started complaining he now drives by three times a week he comes by 45 50 miles an hour then there's a car coming behind him so it pulls over to the side and parks. At my corner, police kept going. I can't figure this out. Nobody parks at this corner. There's no reason for anybody to park at this corner. And he parks on the opposite side of the street, gets out of the car on the passenger side, and it's the same guy that I just saw And because I saw the same backpack. He walks over to the solar panels again. Huh. And he's talking to the person in the car, and the person gets out, and it's a female. Don't know who these people are. So they hover around, and then the police come back. The sheriff officer comes back. They talk, go over to the solar panels again. Then they go back to the middle of the road, and they start talking. Then the sheriff comes up to the door, and he knocks. He gets no answer because I didn't invite him here. There's no reason for any of them to be here. I did not ever give them opportunity to come knocking on my door. I don't have an appointment with them. This is a business address. I don't do business on Saturdays. Not like that. The sheriff starts taking pictures of everything. Takes pictures of the bottom and around the side and the back, and he takes pictures of all the license plates. That kind of offended me. I, I guess he wanted me to come out there and tell him, you know, what do you think you're doing? But of course I didn't. Then he goes back to them, and after he goes back to these people, he comes back and he places in the door his card. But he puts it in such a way that if the door opens, the, call fa the card falls to the ground, which means that he wanted to make sure that he was aware of whether somebody was here or not. So if the door opened, card falls to the ground, ta-da. Okay. So eventually, in the morning, I got up, left, got the card, gave him a text message. I haven't heard back from him. Now, I figured because they all appeared to have the same mannerisms, same walk, same stance. I thought they were all officers because another truck later came by, parked about a half a mile away, just staring at the property out of the camera. But the camera could still pick up the truck, and he had to pull on the road, so the camera still got pictures of the truck. And then he leaves 20 minutes after he pulls up. Then that little small car comes by again, ever so slowly looking at the solar panels again. And then they leave. Nobody comes by after that. And I come back home on Sunday. And I figured, well, maybe one of these people have gotten mad at me for the videos and the information being put out because there is some pretty interesting information and they got more to come. Uh, too many secrets being put out there. So maybe they're upset. And I figured, okay, well, somebody's put a warrant out, but I got $75,000 worth of bonds and I will do another $75,000 worth of bonds if necessary. Or another $300,000 worth of bonds. I don't mind. I have enough vehicles for it. What I do at this point is I decide I'm not gonna be concerned about it. At first it bothered me because I need, I don't like surprises, need to know what's going on. So I took my sleeping pill last night, went to sleep, had a pretty all right sleep last night, six hours. And I get up this morning and I decide, even last night I went out and put up uh, more uh, motion detecting lights. I've already had those lights here. 
they've been sitting in a bag and I was supposed to do it on Saturday um, when all of this stuff happened. So I decided I'm going to go back about my business and do what I was going to do in the first place. So I put up my 12 different motion detector lights that lights this place up. So no matter where I walk, I don't have to walk, worry about walking on a snake or anything like that, which is the problem I had in New Mexico. So many times I almost stepped on top of a snake that was asleep on top of the ground, rattlesnakes. So I decided that's why I have the motion detector lights so that when I'm outside, I can see where I'm walking. So this place, wherever you go, you can see the ground. And then I came back in, and then this morning, about 8 o'clock, the two sheriff officers that normally come by came by, and drove right past the place, didn't slow down, didn't stop. I left a message for them yesterday. And I told him this, and I did this specifically because I needed to show him who I was. I said, I got your card indicating that you came by yesterday. So when I checked the cameras, I saw that you had taken photos while on my property. I didn't give you permission to take photos while on this company property. As a matter of fact, this is company property, and it has signs up saying no trespass. Whether you're in the middle of an investigation or whatever it is you're claiming to be, there is no evidence of anybody committing any crimes over here, and nobody witnessed anyone committing any crimes over here. So you're taking photos? And if you're going to rely on the fact that it was in plain view, public view, public view is on the public sidewalk. Public view is not on this property where there are no trespassing signs. You don't have the right to public view on this property ever. I said, I'm very unhappy about that. And I ended the communication because I informed him that he did not see the reason why he was at the property. So after I documented that, and there was a reason I did that, that was just in case somebody had created a warrant like they did before in 2018 out of the blue, which had no basis, no foundation whatsoever, as the court determined. Just in case they did that again, this time it gets kicked out like the gentleman in Puerto Rico whom I had him give his attorney a little note where I said every time they hit the clicker, it constitutes an illegal search. There is this doctrine known as the forbidden fruit doctrine. Most cases go away the very first day the case started because police officers always break the law. Every single time. That's everybody whose case I've ever handled. I need to know what happened the day of the arrest. I don't care about anything else. None of the other stuff makes any sense. Forbidden fruit doctrine. That's how I get people out of jail. I go after the police because if they violated the law to arrest the person, that means they violated other laws. And it doesn't matter because the poisonous tree doctrine or what I refer to as the forbidden fruit doctrine says eating from the tree in the first place was the sin. Everything that happened after that doesn't matter. The fact that that sin originally occurred means that there is no case because you cannot reward a wrongdoer. There is a maximum law that you cannot reward a wrongdoer. So why am I telling you all this story? Because we have given you guys enough information to let you know exactly where we're going as an organization, exactly what we require, exactly what we're supposed to be doing. That's why the organization doesn't falter when I'm not around. Yeah, the Legal Redress Commission, that was because I, I didn't leave the individual in charge. They wanted him as CEO, and I said, if that's what you guys want, then that's it, and made him CEO. Didn't make him the captain of the ship. It just gave him a ceremonial title. He systematically got rid of all of the people that I brought in, making them want to quit, giving them a hard time, and then firing the others. He didn't have the authority to do so, especially not without my input. But because I was in there and not out here, there was not much I could do about it because he had control of all of the websites and all of the emails. So I told people I'd take care of it when I got out. When I got out, he blocked my access to everything because I wouldn't do what he wanted as if I was his child. And as I said before, everyone who's ever done me wrong has always had to suffer a consequence. And I can't help 
nor would I be remiss without highlighting the fact that not only did he take money from a lot of our clients at the Legal Redress Commission and leaving them the way he left them, but he tried to ruin my reputation, which is why I ruined his. Putting, ruined the company, demolished my own company by bad-mouthing it on YouTube. Videos that he had no control over because it had the title of the company. So whenever they looked for it, that's what they found. He now suffers from dual kidney failure and was sent somebody to ask me for a donation. Now, I have no remorse. I have no animosity. I have no hatred. I have no anger for this person. But giving a donation ain't going to do him any bit of good. There is nothing a donation is going to be able to get him because kidney transplants are very expensive. Wasn't going to do a video to let everybody know or none of that. I already told him the same as the, even if it was my brother. It would be the same way. It has nothing to do with pride or anything like that. They knew the consequences of betraying my trust. My own brother I don't speak to to this day because he told me, I know that when I do this, you're not going to ever speak to me again. Pay attention to his words. I know that when I do this, you are not going to ever speak to me again. He knew that it was because of his actions. And here it is. That was in 2016. It is 2023. And guess what he's doing? Calling me up, asking me for my help. Because he got mad because his house was in foreclosure and I was trying to help him save his house out of foreclosure. And he thought he was going to lose it. When it turned out, all the paperwork that I'd done worked. He's still in his house to this day. He's getting ready to apply for another loan to refinance the house. The house is worth $300,000 less, but it's still worth over $900,000. And I own 25%. Anybody else would have extorted him. 25%? Then you're going to pay me. No, I'm going to get paid. 25%, no. Here's your paperwork. Here's the notary. Be gone. And he had to do it through a third party. He couldn't contact me directly. So I have no animosity towards anyone. I just have the right to choose who I will do business with and who I will be around. And that one, I promised I would never, ever be without him being able to depend on me. But as I said, he brought that on himself. He knew that that was the only way to cause me to stay away. And he was 100% right. So now that you know what we've been through as organizations, now you'll understand that there's an idea. You cut off the head and the rest of the body falters. Ladies and gentlemen, I designed the organization so that you cut off the head, the rest of the organization continues. So you cut off this head, that doesn't stop the organization from doing all the things it's been doing because it's a routine. We've been doing it month after month, week after week, recording all of the videos, so there is no stopping us as Whitehead and his buddy would say. Ladies and gentlemen, so that you get it, all of the instructions as to where we're going and where we're headed are right there. There's no need to worry about Mr. Eon because eventually I'm not going to be here. So I'm going to tell you guys the same thing I told you last week, the same as I've been trying to stress to everybody. I really do advocate this book. I don't advocate greed or striving after riches or striving after wealth or striving after money. But Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the audio book on YouTube. Some of you find it difficult to understand some of the things I talk about. All you have to do is listen to that. Don't listen to it so that you gain information. Listen to it to see if it's something I've already talked about, and then understand it. I've never listened to that book before. 
those philosophies that the father is given in that book, that is the story that's being told. And I only like that particular audio book because it's being told as if it's a story. It's not being read as if it's a book. If it was being read, if it was a book, it would be boring to me. But as the guy telling the story tells the story, I'm literally sitting up there imagining the scene. You're pretty good if you're able to do that with people. Give them a story where they can imagine themselves in that story, being able to see what's going on in the surroundings. My father taught me to do that when I was a kid. Well, he taught all of us to do that when we were kids. When we read a story, try to imagine ourselves being there. And I, he got that from another organization, but it's a common thing. Well, this particular story, that's why I don't like reading books. Books are boring. They don't capture my imagination. It was a bright sunny day in the middle of autumn. The sky was a crisp blue, but tinge of orange. And it was just past sunset. Why? Let me use my imagination. Don't tell me everything. Now I can't use my imagination because you just sat up there and spoiled everything. Why can't I imagine what type of sunset it was and what type of day it was and whether it was sunny but partly cloudy? Why can't I imagine that? So I hate reading books because there was a tradition of doing that because people needed their books to have more words. Then they started paying people to write books and they told them you have to have 20,000 words. So they would just sit up there and just add words just to be adding words. Well, that took away from the authenticity of the book. So, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the audiobook on YouTube. Six hours is the one you're looking for. Why six hours? Why that one? Because that particular book, he's going to tell you all you need to know to understand money. Now, there are some things that we know more now than they knew back in 1956. And even we know now compared to what he's doing because the author of that book is still alive. And so is the friend of his that he's talking about. We know more now than they knew now because they don't know about the March 9, 1933 Act. But they knew about money. They knew about money having no value, no worth. That's very hard to find out in society. But the rich people know that money has no worth. The theme of the book is how to make money. Now, other people won't say that. And I've only listened to one chapter and about maybe a page of the second chapter. But I know the theme of the book is how to make money. Rich dad, poor dad. One father was living to make money, and the other father was existing for the sake of money. Ladies and gentlemen, I teach people how to make money. Everybody, <laughs> all of that ignorance, because it's ignorance. There's a story the father tells the kids. They bring together a bunch of tin. They put it in this little, they, they literally <laughs> built this little furnace, put the tin in the furnace, and when they finish, they pour the molten tin into molds, and they create nickels, and they make money because they misunderstood him. They took him literally and logically. All kids do literal and logic, especially boys. My mother and father knew that about me. I was literal. I was logic. To this day, I am literal. I am logic. Never stepped away from that. Well, he told them they had the right idea, but that's called counterfeiting, and it's illegal. So he told them they, would, they got the idea, but now they need to know how to do it in practice, how to make money. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I figured out how to make money. Did it without that book. You see, all these corporations, and some of you have heard the story, but that's okay because I'm going to tell it again. All these corporations out there are staying in business when the economy is horrible. The smaller corporations go out of business because they don't know what the bigger corporations know. And the bigger corporations have those accountants, those CPAs, and those attorneys who are well-versed in law because that's their job. That's why they keep those jobs, because they know something that everybody else doesn't know. Hmm. What is that? Well, as I just said, there's no money. 
wait a minute, if there is no money, then that means the U.S. dollar is part of a Ponzi scheme. Let me say it again. There is no money. And so because there is no money, there is no way for there to be inflation. For instance, how can you have inflation when every dollar is equal? It's going to take some of you a couple of seconds to get what I just said. 1933, the June 5th, 1933 Act specifically says, an act to uniform the coins and currencies of the United States. And it talked about equal power for every dollar. Well, again, remember, I'm literal and logical. I know a penny is a penny dollar. I know a nickel is a nickel dollar. I know a dime is a dime dollar. And I know a quarter is a quarter dollar. It even tells you on a quarter, it's a quarter dollar. So that's a dollar. And it has equal value as all other dollars. 50 cent piece is called 50 cent dollar piece. Huh. And the dollar coin is called exactly a dollar. Equal power for every dollar. Now that makes a lot of sense now. So if a penny is worth the same as a dollar bill, then a $1 bill is worth the same as $450,000 $1 bills. Equal power for every dollar. So I took that concept in 2011 and I wrote on the back of a dollar bill, $220,000 payable to Wells Fargo Bank. And I sent them five of those. I also sent the Miles Trial money orders. Can't tell which one worked because I sent them all of this at the beginning. Here's your money. And three months later, we received the letter saying we'll no longer be attempting to collect on this debt. The account shows a zero balance. Now, mind you, they had already foreclosed on the home, but there was still a 200, it was a $480,000 home there was a $220,000 balance on the account. And that's gone. Because just simply understood what money was and what it wasn't. Now I teach people, this is a taught, how to use tax credits. What are tax credits? They're dollar for dollar. <laughs> Doesn't the law said that there should be equal power for every dollar. Well, if tax credits are dollar for dollar, that's where the phrase comes from, that law, June 5th, 1933. The taxpayer, uh, tax credits are dollar for dollar. That means they have equal power. Uh, tax credits can be bought. They can be sold. They can be assigned like a mortgage, or they can be transferred like a mortgage. Tax credits. They can be used to offset debts. They can be used as collateral. Uh, tax credits operate as a medium of exchange. Ah, they're money. Again, creating money out of thin air. Nobody focuses. So I tell people, hey, we're going to give you tax credits. And they don't get it. They don't understand it. And not only we're we going to give you tax credits, but we're going to show you how to offset your debt with the financial institution. Yeah, you had a business relationship. It's called banking business. As a matter of fact, if you go and get an EIN number and you set up a bank account, they ask you, what is the reason for the bank account? And you simply tell them for banking purposes. You don't have to give them the exact reason, but you just simply say for making deposits, which makes you a depository institution. You're receiving a deposit and you're making a deposit. That makes you and that bank depository institutions. We'll get into that, how the law defines it at another time.
but you're conducting banking business, which qualifies you as a bank under law. And as a bank, you can take those credits and apply it and then offset it. But I told people, can't teach them everything at once. Can't teach you guys everything at once. What I have to do is tell you right now what you are only concerned with is documenting your credits on the record. That's why we're creating the other organization to do exactly that. Documenting the credits on the record, sending it to them so it gets documented on your transcript. Now you have evidence of your credits. Now you can start using those credits as collateral. Now you can start using those credits as backing for instruments that are securities. And once you back those instruments as securities, then you can start depositing them into Treasury Direct accounts. It's just that nobody's paying attention. I've been yelling, screaming, and shouting this stuff. Everybody thinks they're just tax credits. They don't mean nothing. Look, they just sitting there. What can I do with them? Okay, I can't turn them into money. That's the response I get from so many people, and it is so frustrating because of the amount of ignorance on this planet. Okay, what I'm doing right here is everything I just explained at the beginning of this meeting after the young lady came on, I'm going to play the audio portion for everybody so that they can hear how our meetings are discussed, how our organizations are set up, so that they will recognize that there is no reason for them to worry should somebody get rid of this head. Don't matter, don't need it, don't care. My organizations that I put together are designed to last because I've been doing this for too long. These were the things I was concerned about when I first started my first organization, and I started my first organization in 1988. I tried in 1987 and 1986, um, but didn't work. And because I didn't fully understand. But when I reached 21, 22, I started to better understand corporations and organizations, coming up with some very good concepts. And it wasn't until the year 1999 that I started the Legal Redress Commission. I actually started in 1998 after Richard Fuller told me about redress and I did some research that it was time for me to start setting up corporations that would never die. That no matter what, they would stand the test of time. Why? Well. Back then, I wasn't concerned about tax credits as much. I knew about tax credits, but there was that was not my focus. My focus was creating a commission, because you always hear about these commissions. You know, you, you, you heard Watergate Commission, a Warren Commission, and all these other commissions. Damn, what does a commission do? Well, a commission is not a think tank. Commission comes together and they make decisions on behalf of others or on behalf of an organization. And the commission controls everything. That's why it was called the Legal Redress Commission. That's where the name came from, because it was supposed to be set up as a commission. SACOM, Securities Acquisition Trust Commission. SICOM, Securities Investment Trust Commission. That's been the whole concept. The concept is supposed to be nine people, four senior, five junior, same as the United Nations. A security Council is set up. That's why they set it up that way, because it is a corporation. That's why all the little smaller little peon corporations are upset, because the senior commissioners or the Security Council are only five members, and they have a dual veto vote. Now, that's stupid. A dual veto vote, that's so that they can since it's five of them, you multiply that by 10, and then there's four remainders, 10 will always outdo four. So there's never a tie. That's why they did that. So that the four junior members don't have a say. That's why most of our organizations is four commissioners, or excuse me, four commissioners, four main commissioners, and five junior commissioners. That's the way it was set up originally. But we decided to make incentives, but we also decided that if there's ever a tie, then it's a straight vote. So that takes care of any of that 
shenanigans and we have no lobbying. So people can't vote and then get somebody else to vote with them. That's termination. I don't care how long the person has been here. Lobbying is absolutely illegal in all of my organizations. All right, so let's have a conversation so that you guys can understand because we need to understand what money is. The first thing we're going to go to is I R S T A X T O P I C. I asked tax topic 453. I don't even have to put up 453 because it's been searched for way too much as a result of some idiot putting up YouTube videos. Because before that, it took me years to find that document. I didn't even know it existed, but I was looking for it. And it, even when I first found it, it was hard to pull it up a second and third time. So once I did the video, it started popping up in search results. And so now it's just there. Now, the AI system, and it's not my voice recognition, but it is the AI system that's connected to all of your units. That's what's running the internet right now. Now, if you guys didn't understand what I just said, the internet is being ran by an AI system. It's not Google. Google's not monitoring it. They have left the AI in charge of the whole system. The AI flags, the AI monitor, the AI watches. Okay, and because the AI gets to do that, let's see. Below is a summary of significant IRS services. Glance at relevant tax weeklies. I don't even know why this is here. Tax controversy, 6360. I am, oh, that's the name of the website. I have no adjusting income tax or income topic adjustments, but I didn't ask for any of this. Take a look. None of these are IRS tax topic 453, but Oh, I'm sorry, let me say it again, as I told you, AI system. Now this is Mohik. I'm gonna take us to, as a matter of fact, I was supposed to change this. This is a different browser. So I'm gonna change this to Google. And that's actually interesting that it's on Mohik that way. Let's go there, google.com. And I'm only using Google because we're just doing I R S T A. Oh, that's R A T A X. And then we do T O P I C. Where's my 453? And eventually I check on these because you see IRS tax topic 427. Let's see what that says, rule. Statutory stock options. So, yes, you can see why that would be clicked on because of all the people who are invested in stocks and they receive stocks as payment. And so we go to 453 and 453 should become everybody's best friend because it's only one page. It's not three, four pages. It is very short. It is only one page. I didn't even know they had that print button. I've been copying, let's do that. I've been copying it and setting it up. So I'm gonna actually print it because I'm going to send it to someone. So, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I need to make it smaller so that we fit everything on the page. And what I'm going to do real quick is, you know, I think I'm going to rewrite this so it gets rid of the junk. So, so if someone owes you money and you can't collect, you have a bad debt because they owe you money. If it was a gift, then they wouldn't owe you anything. So if someone owes you money and you can't collect, you have a bad debt. We don't need a discussion on the matter. We know what a bad debt is. That person owes me and needs to pay. Then it says guidelines for small businesses, individuals who use Schedule C. That means sole proprietors for the most part because they're not the only small business that use Schedule C. So it's letting you know that you can use Schedule C then it says 550 for investment income and expenses, writing that junk off as an expense. Next, it says generally. So let's get rid of the word generally and let's replace it with something that says the same thing. Usually, to deduct a bad debt, you must have included it in the amount of your income or loaned out your cash. How is that? That's the accrual method. The accrual method is where you do the accounting month by month. You zero out the account every month. So 
the accrual method is when I go to the store and I'm looking to purchase something in that store, but I can't purchase it because there is no money. So when I go to that store, what the law allows me to do is to give them a coupon and agree to an exchange rate and even exchange. They have a bill of laden showing that they paid something for that, that they lost some revenue. And so what I do is I give them a coupon to offset what they have lost. Sorry, I'm stepping away from the computer for just a second. I have um, someone on TikTok, not TikTok, but uh, Telegram told me about peppermint and mixing it and using it as bug spray. And I can tell you that that junk actually works better than I thought. Now, I know most mints, uh, bugs, and other things hate mints, uh, including rodents. So I'm the peppermint guy. I got plenty of peppermint anyway. So anyway, back to the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, when you go into that store, and you go to that register, you just picked up a product from them, and they tell you, well, if you want to leave our store with that, you're going to have to give us something that we consider comparable to what you have, something that has the same value. And so you hand them something that equates to the same value. And sometimes they go, wait, hold on, this is too much. Here, we're going to give you some change back. Yeah, you gave us too much. What you have just done is you've just accomplished the accrual method. Why? Because you acquired a deficit by picking up the item. And now you need to offset that deficit to bring your account to zero. Not bringing that store's account to zero. Because when you give them those funds, you're bringing their account to zero. You need to bring your own account to zero. And that's the problem. We haven't been doing our math. We've been relying on their math. That's why at our organization, we require everyone to provide a statement of accounting. All they have to do is fill in the blank. Why? Because we need to have our own accounting. So every time you go to a store, you're using the accrual method and you don't even realize it. It's just that companies and banks and these accountants and these CPAs all tell you you can't do it that way because you're not a business. Of course you are a business. There's no definition for business in the IRC. So tax business, banking business, personal business, private business, my mama's business, everybody has a business. People are even told to M-Y-O-B, mind your own business. So any business can use the accrual method. That's why it says generally or usually to deduct a bad debt, you must show that you've already done the accounting. That's what it says, that you previously included the amount in, in your income or loan out your cash. You've already done the accounting previously, month after month after month. Now you can wait to the end of the year to add it all up, but as long as at the every transaction at the end of the month is zero, and that's what you need to know. If you've paid for everything, then those of you who use credit cards, this has nothing to do with credit cards. This has everything to do with zeroing out your account every month. We do it, all of us do it. We do it every time we go to the store, we zero out our account. We go to the gas station, we zero out our account. We don't realize that we're already using the accrual method. We're incurring a debt and we're offsetting a debt by paying. So we're receiving the product and we're giving the coupons for the product. That's the offset. That's zeroing out the account. Now we don't owe anything else once we leave a store. Because if we do, somebody's coming up behind us, grabbing us by the shoulder. Yeah, they're grabbing people these days and saying, excuse me, you need to pay for that. Okay? Because you attempted to leave with a unbalanced account. Before you leave the store, the account must zero out. That's the accrual method. Everybody does it every single day and they think the accrual method is so complicated because you have these tax agents, these books, and all of these people who've made a career out of this making you think it's complicated. 
So let's get past this sentence because this is the stupid sentence. If you are a cash method taxpayer, and most individuals are because, and I'm going to say it because nobody else wants to say it this way, because most individuals are stupid. Stupid doesn't mean that you <laughs> are, are dumb. Stupid means that you lack knowledge. The same as ignorant. Ignorant means you lack knowledge. But here's the problem with stupid. Stupid also means a person who refuses to listen. Ladies and gentlemen, people keep trying to tell you all the time that you're doing it wrong. You go to a tax agent and watch them tell you you're doing it wrong. They won't tell you how to do it right, but they'll tell you you did this wrong. And then when they correct it, they're correcting it according to your approval. Here, I want you to take a look at this and tell me if this is all right. Why is your tax agent telling you that you need to approve it and tell them it's all right? So many tax agents, people have gone to them and told them, I need you to use the accrual method. And they told them no. There is no law saying that only businesses can use the accrual method. But that's what they'll tell you, as if they're telling you the truth. It says you usually can't take a bad debt for unpaid wages, rent, fees, interest, dividends, or similar items of taxable income if you are a cash method taxpayer. But now we just realize that we're all accrual method taxpayers because we use the accrual method every single day. So you can take a bad debt deductions for unpaid salaries. You know, I think my boss should be paying me $200,000 a year. Some people are going to get stupid. There's, there's that word again. Now, this, is, this word means a person who doesn't listen. So some people are going to get stupid because you, you, you're not born stupid. Nobody's ever born stupid. A stupid person, Forrest Gump's mama, very, very wise woman, a genius in my book. Stupid is what stupid does. A person becomes stupid by their actions because they refuse to listen. So generally or usually you can take a bad debt deduction for unpaid salaries. My boss owes me $200 a year and he's only paying me $24,000. This position, other people are being paid this amount. And so because the average person makes this amount for doing a similar type job, that's what I should be paid. So I'm going to offset what he should be paying me against what he's paying me, and I'm going to write it off. I'm going to forgive him of his stupidness. Wages, the same thing. He should be paying me, blah, 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 blah. Rent. You know, my landlord is charging me this much rent, and I'm having to pay that, but this place should be worth blah, 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 and I should only be paying this for this place. And then I got to do all the upkeep and the maintenance, and I got to maintain this place and put light bulbs in and sweep the floor and wipe banisters down. I got to do all the housekeeping. But they own the property? No, I'm going to charge them for this, and I'm going to write that junk off. Excuse me. Fees. Oh, and that, they called me to that court. I've been to the court like seven times this year. They're going to they gonna get charged some fees for me having to come up there going to charge me a fee for filing something. Well, now I'm going to charge them a fee. Interest. Oh, and then they... My bank got me paying on this mortgage when they've already received the money, and I keep asking them for this. Oh, no, I'm going to charge them some interest for me having to go through all of this, want me to go here and go there and not pay me for going there. Uh-uh. By the way, taking care of your children, I know you think that you are supposed to do that, and technically you are, but when the United States took gold out of the economy, they specifically, and by the way, people say they put it back. No, they didn't. They did not amend the Trading with the Enemy Act. The act to abrogate the gold clause was passed, and Presidential Proclamation 2039 has never been repealed or amended. So there is no gold back anything in this country. But because of that, ladies and gentlemen, this is why you get to offset. If things were backed by gold, you would not have the ability of offsetting. You would have the ability of writing everything off. Remember, it tells you, right, where's my expenses word? Because I just read it. I know it's up here somewhere. Well, I ain't going to be worried about it because I know that businesses get to write off bad debts as business expenses. You guys get to do the exact same thing. The very same thing is they get to write off their debt, their expenses that they loan out. They get to write that off. So do you.
It's called a business expense. Oh, it was in this thing right there. There it is right there. Investment income and expenses. Now, they want to tell you that that's only for businesses. Look at that. So this tells you that it includes small businesses and individual. See, for individuals who use Schedule C. So it's not just for these type of businesses. Back to this. Or similar items of taxable income. What about your cost of living? The government in 1933 said, we got you. You don't have to worry about that. We're going to take care of all of your necessities. Has the government been taking care of your necessities? We'll charge the government. The government would charge you in a split second. They're taxing you on what's not taxable income. Your necessities cannot be taxed. It's called your right to life. They cannot charge you for living. It's against the law. The Fifth Amendment prohibits that. The Fourth Amendment prohibits that. The First Amendment prohibits that. It says Congress shall make no law. So how can they charge you on your labor? That's your labor. That belongs to you. It doesn't belong to them. Your labor, when you go out there and work for somebody, is an even exchange. You do the labor, the same as when you go into that grocery store. You do the labor. Your employer has to now compensate you for that time because you have an agreement. The government cannot interfere with that agreement, nor can they take advantage of the agreement by charging you for your own labor. That is called slavery. To make you pay to work, that would mean they own everything. But of course they don't. But our capitulation shows that they do. Then we go, this is similar items of taxable income. Anything that's taxable can be written off is what they're telling you guys. Similar items of taxable income. Anything that's taxed can be written off. Then it says, for a bad debt, you must show, so there has to be, you have to document it, you have to put it in writing someplace, that at the time of the transaction, you intended to make a loan and not a gift. Well, the reason why you show this is by saying, hey, you owe me money. Send them a bill. That's it. That's how you show that you, you didn't intend for it to be a gift. You ain't got to say nothing else. But technically, here's the thing. You can also make a statement that this was not intended to be a gift. If it was a gift, I wouldn't be telling them they owe me. That's, that's how simple you make that. Ain't nobody going to rebut it. Oh, no, this is a gift. I got it on recording right here. See, listen, this is what he said. Oh, even if they had it on recording. Wait, did you record that without my permission? Well, that's inadmissible. If you live in a state that has a statute that says somebody can record you without your permission, then you deem the statute as being unlawful. No one can record you. Your voice is your private property. It's distinct to you. It belongs to you. No one else can take yours and make it theirs. Those of you who, when you were born, <laughs> and these companies patented your DNA, you know that patent ends at the age of 18. See, that patent was done while you were a minor. And the law says that a minor can disaffirm any contract that was made during infancy. I know, I know, people learning things. Now let's get back to this. If you lend your money to a relative or friend with the understanding that you aren't going to get paid back, then you can't collect on a bad debt. But if you did not intend for it to be a gift, then you can collect, and it is a bad debt. That's why that first sentence is there. We're only going to cover down to here. All debts become worthless when the surrounding facts and circumstances, not a debt, all debts become worthless. When the surrounding facts and circumstances indicate that there is no reasonable expectation that the debt will ever be repaid, we are still under the March 9, 1933 Act and the June, I mean, excuse me, March 6, 1933 Presidential Proclamation. We're still in a banking holiday. There is no way that debt's going to be paid so long as they keep running up the deficit because they can never repay the deficit, which means we're going to be in debt indefinitely. Just that simple, indefinitely, if people only understood. To show that the debt is worthless, you must establish that you've taken reasonable steps to collect the debt. Hey, give me my money. That's it. That's all you have to do is say, hey, you owe me, and I don't think you're going to pay me, so I'm just going to forgive the debt. That's all you have to do. That's taking care of two stones, one bird. It is not necessary to go to court.
you don't have to go to nobody's court to get the court to say, yeah, you can do that. If you can show that a judgment from a court would be uncollectible. If they ain't paid me by now, they ain't going to pay me. If a judge tell them to pay me, the judge ain't got no power to make them pay me. This is a civil matter. The judge can't force them. To, yeah, they can order, but they can't force them to do it. So that's your reasonableness of showing that it would be uncollectible. So you don't have to go to court to do that. You may take the deduction only, look at that word there, in the year the debt becomes worthless. That means I got to do it today. I can't do it next year or the year after or the year after. The caveat they don't tell you is you can take this deduction and carry it all the way over here. Now, it's still worthless, but it's worthless in this year. And then after that year, if you want to carry it to the next year, it's still worthless, but it's worthless in that year. Deductions can be carried forward indefinitely for the most part. Says you don't have to wait until the debt is due to determine that it is worthless. So the person who determines whether the debt is worthless or not is you. The government doesn't get no control over that. That's all you. You determine it. They say a lot. Now, this wasn't written by some little staffer. This was written by an attorney and a staffer together. This is the kind of things they had me doing at the age of 16, helping to write junk like this. There are two kinds of bad debt, business and non-business bad debt. We don't care about non-business. We want to write it off. Remember, this is business. That's the whole purpose of this. So why would we, why would we care about non-business bad debt? So we're gonna. That's why I said we're not gonna focus on that. That ain't got nothing to do with nothing. Bad business debts or business bad debts. Usually, a business bad debt is a loss from the worthlessness of a debt that was either created or acquired during a trade or a business, or is closely related to a trade or a business when it became partly or totally worthless. What is that saying? Basically, a business bad debt is any debt that's incurred by a business while conducting business. So if it's banking business, personal business, private business, mama's business, cousin's business, Susie's business, it's a business bad debt. A debt is closely related to your trade or business if the primary motive for incurring the debt was business related. That's just that simple. I know that one by heart. So it's personal business, private business. That's my mama's business. My mama say stay out of her business. That's what that's saying. You can deduct it from the Schedule C. Well, let's remember this. Tax guide for small businesses for individuals who use Schedule C. So that means that you all can use the accrual method because you were just told this by the IRS. You can deduct it on your Schedule C 1040. This is for individual income tax filers. And notice it says Schedule C 1040, profit and loss for business sole proprietorship. We already told you that they gave you a sole proprietorship when they gave you a social security number in other countries, national security number. That's your sole proprietorship. Everybody has it. That's why it's on the 1040. Or on your application, or when, excuse me, or on your applicable, applicable business income tax return. That's the 3800. It talks about that junk later in here. The following are examples of business bad debt. Do not go off of this right here. This ain't an example of business bad debt. We already found out what examples of business bad debt. You usually, we're going to get rid of the word can't because nobody likes the word can't. Can't does not exist in life. So you usually can take a bad debt deduction for unpaid rents, salaries, wages, fees, interest, dividends, and other taxable income. Everybody has been waiting on this person to pay or the county to pay, especially those people who wait for things like Section 8 or wait for the county to approve them for this or approve them for that. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've got to wait for anything, you might as well start charging fees. It's business related because they're asking you to wait and you're doing an administrative process. Like the IRS told me to wait 60 days for them to get back to me on two different accounts. Now, I don't need to charge them, but they're going to get charged. Having me wait, why do I have to wait? You are a public servant. There is no reason for me to wait 60 days. It's either yay or nay. Either I have the right or I don't have the right. See, what they're doing is they're doing um, 
Luther Vandross, they're looking for a reason. And I'm not about to give them one. So that's my right to charge them. So again, we don't have to go by this. You may deduct, you may. <laughs> deduct business bad debts in full or in part from the gross income when figuring your taxable income, not from your net, but from the gross. Because guess what? When they're taxing it, here's the problem. They're taxing your bad debt. Okay, let them tax my bad debt. I don't have a problem with that. But you can also pay attention, deduct it from your net income when figuring out your taxable income. All right, for more information on business bad debt, they say, see this publication. I don't need to see this publication. These publications are not law. They're just guidelines, guidances. Okay, none of this is law. These are publications. Who published them? And who gave them the authority to publish them? The IRS does so under the Administrative Procedures Act. That's how they get it. So back to all of you. You received tax credits. Now you need to write it off. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is the conversation that was had earlier this evening, and I decided to go ahead and do the recording and let the recording be for you all. I would go back over it. I would go over it again and again and again because most of you don't understand tax credits. Many of you have received a lot of tax credits. <sighs> well, not even a lot. You received tax credits, and you don't know what to do with them, and you've been talking to these agents and everything. They don't know what to do. Don't let them lie to you. They know exactly what to do with tax credits. They fill out people's taxes every year. They do business taxes. You're not going in there as a business tax person. You're going in there as an individual. Stop going into them as an individual. Tell them you did. It's for the sole proprietor. It's assigned to the sole proprietor or assigned to the trust or whatever. But know what you're saying to them. You're not speaking their language. They're too dumb. You heard what I said. They're too dumb to think for themselves. That's why they need you to tell them what to do. They need you to think for them. Don't believe me? Go back to a tax agent and ask them what do they know. And watch them just give you the basics because they only know what they know. And nobody's ever come to them talking about tax credits for an individual. Come on now. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be starting an organization that's going to do the datary, datary. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm tired. Data entry for you when it comes to tax credits. They're not going to fill out any documents for you. They're going to provide documents where you provide them the numbers of your credits. You provide them the numbers of your net operating losses. You're going to have to document it for yourself. Okay, what we're going to do is provide you what a list. I just thought about that just now. So now I got to write a note for myself because we're going to provide you with a list and all you got to do is fill out the list. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a lot going on. As you heard at the very beginning, there's a lot going on. L-I-S-T of N-O-L's. Net operating losses. Okay. It should be N-O-E, net operating expenses. Ladies and gentlemen, living expenses are right offable. I'm going to explain this, not going to go into detail. You can ask anybody. You can ask a judge. You can ask a tax agent and watch them lie to you. Because what they will do is they will get technical. So pay attention to what I'm about to say. The Uniform Commercial Code, Article 9, Section 201. Under household goods, consumer goods, tells you that those things are not taxable. Why? Because there are expenses for life or necessary essentials. Necessary essentials are not taxable. Let me show you why. Look at Article 9, Section 209. It says it's exempt. Don't blame me for it. It was the New Hampshire Congress and the New Hampshire Supreme Court that helped me understand that. So that means you get to write that junk off. Don't let nobody tell you you can't. Make them prove you can't. 
Make them prove that your living expenses are taxable. And then show them where they're liars. Your right to life is your right to life. Congress has no authority to tax your right to life. They only have the authority to regulate commerce among the states. Doesn't matter what the Supreme Court decided. The Supreme Court doesn't make the law. Go back and read the Commerce Clause to regulate commerce among the different states and among the foreign states, not among the people. There is no authority to regulate the people. The people are the ones who ordained the Constitution. How are you going to regulate them? They ain't gave you no authority. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I had to sit here for another hour and five minutes for your sake. So I hope you sat here for the whole hour and five minutes for your sake, because this is going to be information to help you. Like I said, the organization, pay attention, is called the Data Masters Incorporated. Data Masters. All they're doing is inputting the data. You now either finish the paperwork yourself or take it to a tax agent to finish it for you. Okay, that you'll have to work out. We, pay attention, cannot answer questions for you. I know, I know, you're going to want to ask questions. We are not qualified to answer those questions for you. We're only qualified to put the information in the forms where the rules say they should go. It's up to you to determine the accuracy of it. The same thing you would do with any other tax agent under these very same rules and guidelines. Pay attention. I said any other tax agent. I'm no longer a tax preparer. I stopped. I did not like it, did not want to do it because it was it was a weak process that the IRS has set up. But let me explain this so that you get it. When you're doing your taxes, you just need to understand not every line needs to be filled. And if they write you and tell you, hey, there's something wrong, then you simply write them back and ask, can you please explain this? I'm not understanding what you mean. And then you respond to what they requested saying that you need to provide. If they tell you you are missing this, you're missing that, then give them what they're asking for. Stop being so stubborn, people. Stop challenging them every time. These are tax credits. This is not that hard. Hey, I got to go, but thank all of you for taking the time. And this is what goes on in the background. This is what we discuss in our meetings. You are the main focus, our clients. Clients come first, the organization comes second, and the members of the organization come third. We don't have a five, six, and seven just yet, but that's the order. And that's what we follow. Hey, take care, everyone. Speak to you next time. Goodbye.